Hi everybody, welcome to Inspirited Live. I'm John Spellman, and tonight we're going to be broadcasting on stewardship. And we're focusing on the lesson, Stewardship After Eden. Uh, so again, I'd like to apologize that we've been away for so long. We've been, uh, we haven't broadcasted during the month of, uh, of January due to a problem that we were having with our hosting service. Uh, but we are back up and running now, and we're uh, producing more broadcasts like Inspirited Live, and we're hoping to um, engage you in Bible study and share God's Word with you. Uh, so before we get started with the lesson, let's just begin with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for opportunity that we can come together to study your Word. Bless us as we study the topic of stewardship, and help us, Lord, to be more faithful in our stewardship towards you. Guide us, we pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. So this quarter we're focusing on stewardship, and um, in previous lessons, which um, you know we weren't uh, here to cover, uh, it talked about that we are stewards of different things, but especially uh, when, you, when you factor in the fact that everything belongs to God, that God is the creator of all things, and everything ultimately belongs to him, that everything we have is not really ours, but really belongs to God, and so God has entrusted things to us, and we are accountable for what we choose to do with them. Um, so God holds us accountable for how we live our lives and how we use the resources that he has blessed us with. And things like love of self or love of money um, and this attraction toward materialism uh, get us to a point where we're not focused on using God's resources for God's purposes. Instead, we're being selfish and we're using it for ourselves rather than using it to glorify God. And that creates a problem because then we become unfaithful stewards. And one of the interesting things that the lessons bring out is the fact that if a person is a faithful steward, the first, one, of the, um, one of the first things about a faithful steward is that they recognize that all that they have is not theirs. If you live your life as if everything you have belongs to you, then essentially what you're doing is you're saying, this is my stuff, I'm going to do what I want to do with it, it's all about me. But when you live your life realizing that everything that you have belongs to God, and that you're accountable for how you use it, then you start to live life and see your possessions and uh, the material things that we might have as a, a little bit differently. We see it as these are things that I need to use to glorify God because he has entrusted these things to me for a purpose. Okay, So there are two different ways of living. We can live the selfish life in which everything we have we think is ours when it really belongs to God, and we live for ourselves using those things which we have to please ourselves. And the other way of living is to recognize that everything that we have is a gift from God and that uh, he has entrusted these things to us for a purpose. I want to start off by reading 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 4. So turn with me there for a moment. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 4, which says, But as we were allowed of God to be put in trust with the gospel, even so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God, which trieth our hearts. So notice here it says that God has entrusted to his people the gospel message. So the gospel isn't something that originates with man. This isn't man's gospel. This is God's gospel. And God has given it to humanity, uh, to Christians in particular, uh, in order to spread it around the world and to share this good news so that others may believe, repent of their sins, and be saved. Um, so God entrusted the gospel message to, uh, to the church. And the church is a steward of this message. Uh, we are placed in, in a position of responsibility to share this gospel message with those around us. And we're not to do it uh, selfishly or to please people, but rather to please God who entrusted it to us. And it's also interesting that First, uh, First Thessalonians chapter 2 verse 4 toward the end of the verse points out that it's God who tries the heart. So God looks at the motives and the intents of the heart he looks at what's really within us. Or he looks at our sincerity uh, in regard to how we treat the things that he entrusts to us. Okay, So we are stewards of, of the environment. Um, and even though we are stewards of the environment, uh, since the time of Adam and Eve, uh, if we had been broadcasting on uh, previous lessons, we would have been talking about how Adam and Eve were entrusted with the garden that God put them in. Uh, so everything that they had belonged to God, but, they, but these things were uh, entrusted to them. They were entrusted with dominion and authority. And when Satan tempted Eve and uh, she betrayed the trust that God had given to her, then Adam and Eve lost that dominion. Um, but yet, God still entrusts 
things to us today, and we are still stewards of the earth. Um, and so we are in, we are stewards of the environment that we live in. And uh, the environment has significantly changed since the time of Adam and Eve. They were they they, they inherited a, par a paradise. God gave them a paradise to live in, in which there was no sin, there was no death, there was no sorrow and suffering. Uh, all the things that we experience here in this in this life were things that they didn't have to worry about before before sin entered the picture. We find that after sin, of course, all the things that we know and dread now exist and were brought into our world. And so now we have sickness and death and suffering. But yet we are still stewards of this planet because God has entrusted it to us. So even though it's different from what Adam and Eve first enjoyed, we are nonetheless still stewards. So when we become God's stewards, our focus on the world and its materialistic values change. And it should be a focus on Christ and on our Creator and, and, and His mission that He has also entrusted to us. So now not only are we stewards of where we live in our environment, but we are also entrusted with the Creator's mission. And that is, of course, reaching a dying world. So, because of this great trust that has been given to us, we are all the more supposed to care for our, for our world. Rather than seeking to see what we can exploit the world to obtain for ourselves and for our own benefit, uh, we are supposed to care for the material world. So, if we are good stewards, we should take care of our environment. And also, as good stewards, we are in care of spiritual truths, which we disseminate uh, to those who are willing to listen uh, to, to the world who needs to know about God's love. Let's take a look at stewardship in the Old Testament. Now, the word steward itself um, is only translated a couple times in the Old Testament. And it seems to be, quite literally, a phrase that means upon the house. So the word that's used for stewardship in, or, or steward, rather, in the Old Testament was a word that meant upon the house. Now, when we look at the Greek um, terminology that's used for this word, we see that it actually adds to the understanding of, that the Old Testament communicated through the, through the use of the word, which meant upon the house. Now, if you take a look at Genesis chapter 43, verse 19, for example, let's just take a look at a few examples of how the word stewardship was used in the Old Testament. So we're going to go to Genesis chapter 43, and verse 19, and this is the story of Joseph, and it says, And they came near to the steward of Joseph's house, and they communed with him at the door of the house. And uh, clearly, I guess Joseph wasn't home at this point. Now, what's interesting about this is that when you see here where it says, steward, and we, took, we take that phrase and we put in upon the house, so it says, And they came near to the one who was upon the house, and they commune with him at the door of the house. So this phrase, upon the house, or steward, simply meant that this person was basically in charge of what Joseph had. Joseph entrusted all that he had to the steward, and he was uh, in, 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 um, engaged in taking care of Joseph's goods and, and, and Joseph's possessions. Obviously, in the absence of Joseph, uh, who was often busy taking care of uh, Pharaoh's um, you know, uh, supply of food and grain. So basically, a steward was a, would be the, what we would call a maid or a housekeeper, um, somebody who manages your affairs in your absence. So when you think about how some people who work a lot, who uh, you know, who, who are who are so busy and engaged with um, you know whatever it is that they do in their profession, they may not have a lot of time to be able to take care of or manage. Uh, the, 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 the needs of a household. So, for example, you know, if you work from 5 o'clock in the morning until 8 o'clock at night, um, and, and you know, how could you also be expected to then come home and cook dinner and fold the clothes and wash the clothes and get things ready for the next day and clean the house? I mean, if, if, if a person consistently works hard throughout the day, and they're left with very little time when they come home tired, then obviously they're not going to be able to take care of all the things that they have in their household without help. So sometimes people hire individuals to manage their household affairs. You know, it could be things like uh, hiring a person to take care of your children, uh, 
That person may also cook the meals. That person may also um, fold and, and, and take care of the laundry. So that person would be entrusted with all that you have in managing the household affairs in the owner's absence. But what's important is to understand that even though this person is entrusted with managing the household, the household does not belong to the steward. The steward is simply entrusted and paid for doing the work that he or she might do, and then you know, they have to recognize that that stuff isn't theirs. They're doing it for the person who owns all these things. So Joseph had a steward over his house while he was taking care of the affairs of, 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 of Egypt. And this person was upon the house, meaning that he was the one who was managing the household and taking care of it. And it's interesting that Joseph at one time was a steward because he was taking care of and managing um, Potiphar's household. So Joseph knew what it was like to be a steward, and we can learn a lot about the principles of stewardship from Joseph and his story. Let's look at Genesis chapter 44 and verse 1 and 4. Verse 1 says, And he commanded the steward of his house, saying, Fill the men's sacks with food as much as they can carry, and put every man's money in his sack's mouth. Verse 4 says, And when they were gone out of the city, and not yet far off, Joseph said unto, unto the steward, Up, follow after the men, and when thou dost overtake them, say unto them, Wherefore have ye rewarded evil for good? So, notice here that Joseph is giving his servant commands. He's, he's telling his servant where to go, what to do, and, and how to overtake his brothers. This is, a, of course, the part of the story where Joseph um, has that cup hidden in um, one of the sacks so that he can accuse and arrest one of his brothers to see if they have changed. He was using this as a, as a means by which he would test them to see if they were still uh, the same old way or if, they, or if they had changed and become better. But his steward obviously must follow his directions and go where he tells him to go because he works for Joseph, essentially, and has charge over everything that he has. And what's also interesting about stewardship is the, is the fact that a lot of times owners didn't even know a lot about some of their possessions or where they would be found or what they could do because the steward was the one who, ma who managed them and who took care of them. So a lot of times a, 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 an owner might not even know all the stuff he has and all the, all the things that he has available or how they work because the steward manages everything for him. It's kind of like having a, a butler, I guess you could say. Uh, somebody who's you know, always present at home, who takes care of all the needs of the household. So in some cases, the steward could know a whole lot more about the household than the owner does. Let me give you another example. In Genesis chapter 39, verse 8 and 9, we see what stewardship is when Joseph is serving Potiphar. Uh, verse 8 tells us, but he refused, talking about when, uh, when Potiphar's wife is trying to lie with him, uh, Joseph refuses and he says, Behold, my master, what if not what, what is with me in the house, and he hath committed all that he hath to my hand. There is none greater in this house than I, neither, neither hath he kept back anything from me but thee, because thou art his wife. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? So notice here that Joseph recognized that his stewardship to Potiphar um, correlates with his salvation experience, or rather with his, not his salvation experience, but with his uh, relationship with, his, with, with God. Because to be unfaithful and take advantage of Potiphar was to sin against God. So Joseph recognized that faithfulness to what has been entrusted to him uh, corresponded with faithfulness to God. Uh, to, take Pharaoh, to take Potiphar's wife and lie with her and do a wickedness against him was also to sin against God, and probably even more so. So he says here in verse 8 in particular that Potiphar didn't even know what was in the house because everything was committed to Joseph's hand and entrusted to Joseph to take care of. So the, 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 the um, owner of, of, of all these things can often... So trust the the servant or or the steward that they don't even have knowledge of everything 
that's in that household because everything is managed and taken care of by the steward. So it shows you the great level of trust that would have to exist between those two in order to uh, in order for this person to have such a position over everything that the master has. Let's look at 1 Kings chapter 16, verse 9. And his servant Zimri, captain of half of his chariots, conspired against him as he was in Terza, drinking himself drunk in the house of Arza, steward of, of his house in Terza. So we see how owners place a great level of trust uh, on stewards because they can be greatly taken advantage of should the steward prove unfaithful. And so, of course, there would have to be consequences for something like that, where if a steward was unfaithful and chose to squander what the master had, then obviously that would result in great punishment, probably in some cases even death. Now, stewards were chosen because of their abilities in a lot of cases, uh, or, you know, some of their, in some cases, maybe their wisdom. So as someone saw the potential of, of a steward to manage a household and to be faithful and to be trustworthy, uh, they were likely to be given such a job or such, a, such entrusted with such great responsibility. And like I said before, stewards have to recognize that everything is entrusted to them, but ultimately they belong to the owner. Let's take a look at Genesis chapter 24, verse 34 to 38. And it says here, And he said, I am Abraham's servant, and the Lord hath blessed me, my master, greatly, and he has become great. And he hath given and he have given him flocks and herds and silver and gold and men servants and maid servants and camels and donkeys. And Sarah, my master's wife, bare a son to my master when she was old, and unto him hath he given all that he had. And my master made me swear, saying, Thou shalt not take a wife to my to my son of the daughters of the Canaanites, in whose land I dwell, but thou shalt go unto my father's house and to my kindred and take a wife unto my son. So here we see an example where Eleazar is entrusted with the great responsibility of taking some of Abraham's riches, traveling to a far country, and bringing back a wife for Isaac for his, uh, from, his, from Abraham's uh, tribe or from his people. So stewards must understand their position as we saw how faithful Eliezer was to carry out the requests, not requests, but the, but the uh, commands of, um, of, of Abraham. And when stewards took for their own use what had been entrusted to them, the relationship of trust between them and the owner would then be, at that point, broken, and stewards would be dismissed. Let's look at Genesis chapter 3, verse 23. And this gives us the example of Adam and Eve, where it says, Therefore the Lord God sent him forth from the garden of Eden to till the ground from whence he was taken. So we saw that Adam and Eve lost their privileges in, uh, you know, to remain in the garden and to eat from the tree of life and live forever. Uh, because they had broken the trust that God had given them. And of course, as a result, uh, starting with Adam and Eve, all human beings die. And so, you know, we, as descendants of Adam and Eve, are affected by their, transgression, by their transgression and their unfaithful stewardship in the garden. Let's take a look at Isaiah chapter 22, uh, verse 14, and we're going to read down to verse 18 which says, And it was revealed in mine ears by the Lord of hosts, Surely this iniquity shall not be purged from, from you till, uh, till ye die, saith the Lord of hosts. Thus saith the Lord God of hosts, Go get thee unto, the tr unto this treasurer, even unto Shebna, which is, over the, which is over the house, and say, What hast thou here? And whom hast thou here, that thou hast hewed thee out a, a, a sepulchre here, as he hath as he that heweth him out a sepulchre on high, and, have, and that graveth a habitation for himself in a rock. Behold, the Lord will carry thee away with a mighty captivity, and will surely cover thee. He will surely violently turn and toss thee like a ball into, into a large country. There shalt thou die, and there, shalt, and there the chariots of, of, glory, of thy glory shall be the shame of thy Lord's house. So during Hezekiah's reign, Shebna was appointed the steward as well as treasurer. And, of course, these would be important positions of authority uh, in which great trust was given them. And when this individual broke that trust and abused his position of authority, we find that he was doomed. He would be thrown out. Uh, and we see these, these curses pronounced against him. And uh, here it also says that it's going to happen to him violently. So he's going to be doomed to be brought to another land and put to death, and he would also lose everything and die in shame. So obviously, 
when a person breaks the trust that's given to them as a steward, that doesn't go by lightly. If you think about it, a steward has the potential to completely wipe out uh, his master. I mean, he could, he could, you know, spend all of his livelihood and the, and the owner could come home and have nothing or, or be greatly diminished. So you could imagine how angry a person might be. It would be like you entrusting an investor with your life savings and then he squanders it on, you know, going to the bar every night and paying for drinks for everybody. And then uh, you find out that, you know, he's been, instead of investing your money and doing what needs to be done with it so that you can make a profit, instead, uh, the investor has squandered all of your money on, you know, riotous living and returned to you with basically empty hands. I'm sure, you know, if that was your, your life savings and that was your uh, retirement portfolio, you would be quite livid with that, with that steward. Now, in the Greek, the word steward is actually in two basic, two basic words. You have epitropos, occurring three times, and you have oikonomos, which occurs ten times. And both of these words describe positions that incorporate man managerial responsibilities that are entrusted to the steward by the owner. Let's take a look at Luke chapter 12, verse 48. But he that knew not... Sorry, but he, he that knew not and did not commit and did commit things worthy of stripes shall be beaten. Let me start that again. But he that knew not and did commit things worthy of stripes shall be beaten with few stripes. For unto whomever much is given of him shall be much required. And to whom men have committed much of him, they will ask the more. So the principle here is that when a person is entrusted with much, they are, there's a lot that's required of them. And, you know, we can see that in regard to many uh, things in, in, in the secular world in regard to, you know, like if you entrust a person with a lot of money, you expect a lot from them. If you, if you, if you entrust a person with your household, you expect certain things to be done. You expect them to keep up, you know, with the upkeep of the house. And the same thing is true of our spiritual um, stewardship. If God entrusts a lot of things to us, then we are responsible for those things and more is, is required of us because of that, that great responsibility entrusted to us. And that's why I once heard a pastor say that the, uh, the more high up you go in the church, the more likely you are to go to hell. Because more is entrusted to you and you're responsible for more and you're responsible for the truth that you know. So the more truth you have, the more, the, the more uh, responsibility you take on, um, he was saying the more likely you are to go to hell because if you break that trust, then obviously you're accountable for it. Whereas somebody who doesn't have as much responsibility isn't entrusted with much, so therefore not as much uh, would be required of them because they don't have much to be able to do a lot with. Um, so obviously, you know, if a, a person, just because you have a high up position in the church, it doesn't mean necessarily that an individual is going to hell. He's just talking about the likelihood due to, due to humanity's unfaithfulness. So the principle here is that to whom much is given, much is required. And so when you are entrusted with great things by God, he expects from you faithfulness in those things. And of course, you're, you're required uh, much. Uh, let's take a look at 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 2, which says, Moreover, it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. So when God entrusts things to us, like any other uh, situation of stewardship, he expects faithfulness. So the New Testament expands beyond just household management and seems to emphasize this, this, uh, this responsibility factor. And when we look at other examples of stewardship, we see that they have to deal wisely with that which has been entrusted to them. So for example, if, you, uh, if, you're, if you're in charge of a person's money or, or a st stock portfolio and you see a disaster coming, if you see that perhaps there's about to be an economic collapse or something's going to go wrong, then as a good steward, you would wisely try to av avoid that danger by taking that money and investing it elsewhere, perhaps in a more safe place, so that the master of that, of that money, the owner of that money, doesn't lose what he has entrusted to you. And the same thing is true of spiritual, uh, of, of spiritual stewardship. If you see a disaster coming, uh, then it's your job to avoid that disaster and to protect that which God has entrusted to you. So a wise steward is going to be prepared for the future of Jesus' return. The wise steward, just like in the parable in Luke chapter 16, knows that someday his master is coming back and is going to ask for an account of all the things that he has been entrusted with. And so, likewise, we know that Jesus is, going, is coming back. We know that there's going to be the second coming of Jesus in which our stewardship 
uh, needs to be accounted for. Did what did we do with what God has entrusted to us? Did we share the gospel with souls who needed to hear the message of salvation? Why did God give us the gospel? Why did He entrust us with so much? Because He wanted us to um, to to share that with others so that it would increase the fruit of the kingdom of God. In First Corinthians chapter four verse one, it says, "Let let a man so account of us." as of the ministers of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. So we essentially are stewards of the mysteries of God. And by that, we're talking about, um, you know, the things of scripture, which aren't fully revealed, but enough is revealed to give us uh, understanding of how we are saved and what God is doing on our behalf. So everything, there are some things in the Bible which are a mystery. For example, we don't know, we can't really understand, especially not as God does, how sin was able to manifest uh, was manifested in Satan's heart. Uh, what what led him to make those choices uh, to forsake everything and and, uh, and and act in rebellion against God. Um, we also don't understand uh, the way that God does, uh, and probably will be studying this subject for all eternity. How Jesus can be both human and divine at the same time. Um, or, or, or the great love that he had to lay down the throne, uh, step down uh, from his throne as God, and be fashioned like a, human, like, a, like a human being, and come to earth to die to show his love to humanity and redeem them from the curse of death. So there are a lot of things in the Bible where it's explained but there's still a great amount of mystery with that subject or with those subjects that we're going to be studying and looking into throughout eternity. And the angels of heaven are still looking into with wonder and, 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 and amazement, trying to understand these things. So with what has been revealed to us in scripture, God has entrusted so much to his people uh, and we are stewards of those mysteries to share them with others. Let's look at Titus chapter 1, verse 7, which says, For a bishop must be blameless as the steward of God, not self-willed, not soon angry, not given to wine, no striker, not, not given to filthy lucre. So here we see that a person, you know, when they're entrusted with God's people as a, as a spiritual leader, um, we see here that they should be blameless. They should be without blame. So they have to manage God's flock appropriately. So a lot of times people don't really think about that in some, you know, in some churches today where people just give positions just for the sake of having positions and they don't really think about whether or not the person is going to really be a good fit for that position in terms of how they treat God's people. So when you put people into positions of authority and they mistreat or, or manage that position in a faulty way that causes shame upon the church, then what happens is that that individual... Uh, has become an unfaithful steward and has brought a lot of problems and discontentment in the church and may even cause some people to leave the church. So essentially what they're doing is they're scattering God's flock rather than taking care of it as a good steward should. And so if you have been entrusted with, with uh, the master's sheep and the sheep are all scattered and lost and destroyed, what is the master going to do when he comes for an account of his sheep and wants to know where they are and how they're doing and he's entrusted this great responsibility to you but yet you've chosen to scatter his sheep so obviously no shepherd would be pleased to find that the, that the, that the flock has been scattered and some of them are dead and torn apart by uh, by wolves you know that would be something that uh, 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 um, you know a, a master or, or a shepherd would be furious about well in the same way if God entrusts spiritual responsibility to his to his flock sorry of his flock rather uh, to his, to his, um, you know, to his people, and they're poor stewards of, of God's flock, and and, uh, and scatter his people, and and mistreat them, and abuse them. Then obviously, when Jesus returns, he's not going to be happy with those shepherds who have scattered his flock. Um, <clears throat> or hirelings, rather, would probably be a better term for them because the the. Uh, the good shepherd is the one that owns the sheep, but the hireling is the one hired and entrusted with the stewardship of the, of the sheep. And uh, another interesting passage that just came to mind is, um, let me just see if I can grab it. 
here's an interesting text. Ezekiel chapter 34, verse 2. It's a, and this is God's warning uh, to the, to the uh, leaders of Israel who were mistreating and causing his people to error. So God says, Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God unto the shepherds. Woe be to the shepherds of Israel that do feed themselves. Should not the shepherds feed the flocks? So we see God holding them accountable for how they treat his people. And of course, he's not talking about literal food. He's talking about um, the leaders of Israel feeding um, his people with the word of God. Another passage is in Jeremiah chapter 23, verse 1. This is the one I was looking for earlier. Woe be unto the pastors that destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture, saith the Lord. So God is not pleased when leaders take on positions of authority and then scatter and unfaithfully manage God's, uh, God's, God's people. Uh, because when they scatter his flock, they are, they're rendering poor stewardship, and God is going to hold them accountable for what is rightfully his. So we can't take on positions in the church lightly, because God is entrusting us with great responsibility, and we are accountable for what we do with that responsibility. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 10, As every man hath received the gift, even so minister the same one to another, as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. So here we're talking about spiritual gifts, I believe, um, you know, where God has given to the church many spiritual gifts. But he didn't give these gifts to the church. He didn't give the Holy Spirit to the church just for them to sit around and do nothing. He entrusted them with the Holy Spirit and with these spiritual gifts because he wanted them to uh, turn the world upside down with the gospel. He wanted them to reach souls for the kingdom of God. He expected them to do with those gifts. Uh, and so that's why when Jesus um, spoke about uh, how things were going to be judged in the last days, he talked about it in terms of stewardship, and he talked about it, uh, for example, with the parable of the talents, uh, or, the, or the parable where, where um, a man goes away to a far country, but he entrusts his servants to go and invest his money. And while some invest it, but they have mixed results, uh, one of them chooses not to invest anything, lays it in the ground, does nothing with it, and then... When he gives an account to the master, he says, "Well, I knew you were a man anniversary, and uh, you know I, I didn't I didn't want to lose what you had, so here is what you gave me." And of course, he has no interest; it's just getting back exactly what he had originally been given. And so, um, you know, the, the the master then says to him, "You know, you knew I was a man anniversary. You know, you should have at least given my money to the bank so that when I come again, I could have received what I what I what I gave you with interest." So obviously, when somebody entrusts uh, you know, something financial to someone else, like the bank or like a, like an investment, they want to see a return on their money. They want, to, they want what they gave back with interest. And so when you apply that, 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 that metaphor, that analogy to what has been entrusted to Christians, God is expecting us not just to sit on the gospel message. He's expecting us not just to sit on spiritual gifts, but to use them to produce spiritual fruit. In other words, to reach souls for the kingdom of God. So we're not entrusted with spiritual gifts to sit around and do nothing and look at each other or use them only for selfish means. We're entrusted with, the, with these gifts because God wants us to use them to preach the gospel. So if, if you don't want to go out and preach the gospel, there really is no point to you praying for the, for the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Because what's the point in God giving you the Holy Spirit for you to do nothing with him? The Holy Spirit comes into our lives because he wants to catapult us into mission and to accomplish God's, God's mission and God's purpose. So the moment that we accept Christ, we become stewards and we're called to manage God's resources. And of course, for the purpose of, of preaching the gospel. So we are to manage the spiritual realities of the Christian life in preparation for heaven. Let's take a look at Luke chapter 12, verse 45, which says, but if that servant say in his heart, My Lord delayeth his coming, and shall begin to beat the, the men servants and maidens, and to eat and drink, and, and to be drunken. The Lord of that servant will come in a day when he looketh not for him, and at an hour when he is not aware, and will cut him asunder, will cut him in sunder, and will appoint him his portion with the unbelievers. So here Jesus was using this this um, this parable to illustrate the point that at his return, he's looking for fruit, but also that there is going to be some people who say, oh, the master is taking a long time to come back. Who knows when he's going to come back? We got time, so let's just live how we want to live and use his stuff how we want to use it, 
and take advantage of him, and then when, when we know he's coming back, then maybe we'll get it together. So this is one of the main reasons why the Bible teaches that we are not to know the day or the hour in which Jesus is going to return. The reason why is because he wants to come at such an hour as his people think not. And the reason why is because he's going to make sure, uh, he, he, what he's doing is he's, he's, he's making them give an account of their stewardship. If he came when, when people were expecting him, then they would be fake and they would just kind of get it together at the last minute so that they can smile in his face and say, hey, we have everything you wanted. We did all you were supposed to do. But when you don't know when the master's returning, then you kind of get to see what's really on the servant's heart. You get to see what the servant really wants to do with your goods because, um, you know, you catch them in the act. You catch them kind of like, so to speak, with their pants down. So this passage is basically telling us that there are some people who take the attitude that the Lord is delaying his coming and because they feel that the Lord is delaying his coming, they're beginning to live riotously and do what they want to do and to take advantage of what has been entrusted to, to them because they don't realize the nearness of his return. So people can lose focus not realizing that the time is at hand and that if they're not found faithful, then they're going to be punished for their unfaithfulness with, 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 with what has been entrusted to them. Take a look at Colossians chapter 2, verse 2 and 3, which says that their hearts might be comforted, being knit together in love, and unto all riches of the, of the full assurance of understanding, to the acknowledgement of the mystery of God, and of the Father, and of Christ. Then 1 Timothy chapter 3, sorry, 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, which says, And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory. So the reason why this is called a mystery is because we don't understand all the aspects to how God could do this. How he could be justified in the spirit, how he could be seen by angels, how he could uh, you know, come to earth as a human being, come, uh, manifested in the flesh, that's what that's talking about. Uh, how, how he could preach unto Gentiles as opposed to only the Jews. So there are a lot of mysteries and things that were not understood, uh, but yet were nonetheless true. So the wisdom and knowledge of both the Father and Christ and how God could be manifested in the flesh were mysteries. And, and the apostles who were given this, this, uh, this gospel message, and of course us today uh, who, who read scripture and who are now accustomed to this message, uh, we are stewards of these mysteries to share them with the world and get them to understand what God has done on their behalf. So the word mystery means something that's puzzling or obscure, something that's unknown, unexplained, or incomprehensible. So a lot of times the mysteries of God are things that we just can't comprehend. Um, so the mysteries of God have been recorded in Scripture, even though understanding of them fully is still beyond our comprehension. So even though we, we have it in Scripture, we know what it is, we just can't fully comprehend or understand it. And we'll be studying these things, like I said before, throughout eternity. And that's why um, I believe it's uh, Deuteronomy chapter 29 and verse 29 tells us, The secret things belong unto the Lord our God, but those things which are revealed belong unto us and to our children forever, that, that we may do all the words of this law. So the secret things belong to God, but what is revealed belongs to us and to future generations. God wants us to share these things with future generations, with our children, in other words, and with uh, you know people uh, to listen. So we are entrusted with these great responsibilities because God wants us to share them and to perpetuate these truths and these mysteries so that more and more people will glorify God, understanding what he has done on their behalf. So God wants us as his stewards to, to uh, preserve, to teach, to protect, and to care for divine truth that he has revealed to us. And as 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 9 pointed out, we need to do it with a pure conscience. So in other words, um, you know, when, we, when we think about how we've rendered stewardship, uh, you know, what God has entrusted to us, we, if we have a pure conscience, we know that we did everything we could to serve God and to use what he has given us wisely and to glorify him. Whereas if we live selfishly, we're doing quite the opposite. Let's go to 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 10 for a moment. It says, As every man hath received the gift, 
Even so, minister the same one to another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. So again, we're talking about spiritual gifts. God has trusted each person with spiritual gifts um, in the church so that they can minister and uphold um, the church as well as you know preaching the gospel message. So if a church really has the gifts of, of the Holy Spirit, uh, then they should be on fire doing ministry, not just sitting around looking at each other. Let's take a look at Ephesians chapter 6. And verse uh, 13 to 17, talking about the armor of God. Now, not only has God entrusted us with spiritual truth, but he's also given us um, a... Let me rephrase it differently. Uh, God has also entrusted to us the responsibility of caring for our own spiritual upkeep. Uh, meaning that, you know, being close to God isn't magic. It's not something that um, is is um, something we just sit around and wait to happen. Uh, it's something that must be that is entrusted to us that must be developed. So God does the work. He initiates the work. And then our part is to, is to maintain that relationship. So God does his part in establishing the relationship and in, in creating the grounds for the relationship and being the first to love us before we could ever love him. But then in response to what God has done, we have a, a, a role to play in maintaining what has been given to us. So notice what it says here in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 13. It says, Wherefore, take, you un take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand the evil day, and having done all to stand, stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench the, all the fiery darts of the wicked, and take the helmet, the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. So, the spiritual concepts mentioned here function like armor protecting us in our walk with God, uh, from Satan and his wiles and his, uh, and, and his sorry from his wiles and his attacks uh, to take us off course. So faith, the gospel, salvation, the word of God, righteousness, and truth are all things that protect us as we seek to live for God and accomplish His mission. If we don't manage these things well, we can be overcome by Satan's attacks and brought right back where we don't want to be. So redemption is a gift from God. And it's our most valuable possession because it was purchased at such a high cost that only God himself could pay. So when we look at redemption and how high a price it was to redeem us, it helps us to maintain perspective on our stewardship and to realize that our lives are not about us and our, possession, and our possessions really don't belong to us, but everything, including our lives, belongs to God. So we may have possessions, we, we may have redemption, but we only have it because God has given and entrusted it to us. And because he has entrusted us with this redemption, we need to manage uh, you know, the armor of God uh, we need to manage those spiritual concepts I mentioned before uh, because those are the things that help us to maintain the redemption that God has given to us. So, God gives us salvation and it's not about what we do. We can't, uh, it, we can't earn salvation. It's God who provides it. But once it's been given to us, God entrusts it to us and we're expected to make good choices to maintain it and to be stewards over the redemption already given to us in Christ. And one of the ways that we uh, maintain or, or act as stewards over the redemption that God has given us is by, by uh, doing what we can to develop and, and furnish that relationship that, we, that, that God has begun with us. So we can do that through Bible study. We can do that through prayer. We can do that through learning more and more about salvation, through praising God, through worship. All those things help us to maintain that relationship with God that he has, uh, that he has entrusted to us. And so with the armor of God, we can be protected from the things that Satan would do to distract our attention and take away that redemption from us. Our greatest protection 
is of course in obeying in faith the light that we have been given. So when God entrusts us with light, then by, by obedience to that light, we maintain that, um, that, that protection uh, rather than going in a different direction. So we're expected to be wise stewards. And when you think about the concept of wisdom, um, actually one of the, um, the authors of the book, the author of the book, uh, John Matthews, Stewardship, Motives of the Heart, had something interesting to say about the relationship between wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. It says here on page 40, Wisdom comes as a result of knowledge, understanding, and experience. Knowledge is information. So, you know, whatever knowledge you have, that's just information. And understanding comes from realizing and learning from the implications of the knowledge in, in situations, good or bad, that I have, uh, sorry, good or bad, I have experienced. The combination of these three give you wisdom. So, the way I like to understand it is that you have knowledge. Knowledge is just information. Anybody can acquire information. Understanding is the implications of that, of that knowledge or of that um, information that you have gained. Now, wisdom comes as you experience things, as you go through life experiences, and you see how these implications play out based on the information that was available. You gain wisdom with what to do with those implications or how to manage those implications and how to manage that knowledge. So wisdom is overall, then you have understanding, which is the implications of knowledge, and of course knowledge, which is just the information that you've acquired. Um, so wisdom kind of tells us how to apply the understanding or implications of knowledge that we acquire. See, a lot of people have wisdom and understanding, but they don't have wisdom. Sorry, a lot of people have knowledge and understanding, but they don't have wisdom. So in other words, wisdom is, sorry, maybe knowledge rather is, is, is perhaps an understanding of science. Understanding is perhaps knowing that if you apply these scientific principles in a certain way, you can build a atom bomb or an atomic bomb. But it would take wisdom to understand that even though you could do that, you could uh, apply science in that way, you could, you could, uh, you could reach those implications for knowledge, wisdom would tell a person not to do it. Okay? So wisdom, I would say, is the stewardship of one's understanding and knowledge. How you manage and what decisions you choose to make uh, based on the implications of the knowledge you've acquired. And what's interesting is that a lot of people are unwise. Because wisdom implies that you use the knowledge and understanding that you've gained correctly. So it implies that you're using that knowledge and that understanding to glorify God. You're using that knowledge and understanding to bring about good. And to bring about um, you know, good things as opposed, to, uh, as opposed to a person's ruin. And you can't close the door on recognizing the spiritual implications there as well. Because if you, if you look at the spiritual implications, if you're looking at wisdom, right, uh, then if you're only considering our life here in the temporary, and you're not considering life for eternity, then you can't have true wisdom. So, in other words, if I make decisions, and those decisions are all geared towards increasing my happiness in this life, but I totally ignored eternity, by definition, that's not wisdom because of the fact that I've just actually spent more time working on the temporary instead of on that which lasts for eternity. So, if I'm doing a great for, 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 for the here and the now in the time of, in, 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 um, in the temporary, but I'm doing terrible for eternity, then how much wisdom could I really have? Uh, you know, so wisdom implies that what you're doing is taking you on a path toward eternity, is, is keeping God in mind and in focus, because God is the source of true wisdom and understanding, and it's only in Him that we have a future and that we have an eternity. Let's take a look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10 which says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. So, as stewards, as the Bible teaches, we are all stewards of the Word of God, and also as human beings, we're stewards of, of, uh, of, of uh, this world. 
But as stewards, we need to recognize that there is a judgment. Jesus is coming soon, and soon probation is going to close, and there is going to and there is a judgment in which um, many cases are being decided for eternity. And because there's a judgment in which we are personally accountable for what we do and and how we live and what things were entrusted to us, and the life that God has given to us, we need to live as faithful stewards. So every person is pers is personally accountable. Uh, God believes in, in personal accountability with what he entrusts to us. So when God entrusts something to you, you can't go and say, oh, well, you know, uh, so-and-so is doing this, or so-and-so persuaded me to do that. No, we are personally accountable for what God has entrusted to us, and God is going to render an account for each person individually with what has been entrusted to them. And you can't say, oh, well, this you can't blame this person or that person. No, every individual is personally accountable for uh, what God has entrusted to them. And it's so often that, you know, as human beings, we try to blame other people or we try to push things off or we look at what other people are doing. And we often compare ourselves to what, to, to what other people do rather than taking personal responsibility for our actions, for our beliefs, and for our relationship with God. Uh, but the Bible tells us that because there's going to be a judgment in which each person will be held personally accountable for the light that they have been given and for what has been entrusted to them, that we must live accordingly. Uh, we must be faithful with what God has given to us. We saw in the Garden of Eden, for example, that when Adam was asked, you know, what happened? Adam, where are you? Why are you hiding? Why, how did you know you're naked? Did you eat from the fruit of the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? The first thing Adam does is he blames Eve. Then what does Eve do? Eve blames uh, the, the serpent, right? So we see that there's this shifting of blame rather than this personal accountability. Yes, I did it. I messed up. I made the mistake. Um, and so as soon as sin entered the picture, we saw a deterioration in relationships, uh, first, of course, with God, because he had been uh, sinned against, but also between Adam and Eve, because they're blaming each other. Uh, you know, they're blaming someone else. Right? Adam's blaming Eve, Eve's blaming the serpent, and there's no personal accountability. So as soon as sin, sin entered the picture, we saw a demise of personal accountability. Nobody wanted to take responsibility for their end, uh, although Adam did say, you know, um, uh, the woman that you gave to be with me, she gave me of the tree, and I did eat. So there, you, I guess you could see a glimpse of, uh, of some personal accountability because he did admit to doing it. But God knew already, of course. But the point is that in the judgment, you know, you can't blame uh, someone else for your shortcomings. Everybody's going to be personally accountable. At the end of the day, uh, the serpent was cursed and Adam and Eve were both thrown out of the garden. So it wasn't like God took the excuse, the woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me of this tree. They were both punished because they had both disobeyed. So there is that level of personal accountability with every individual. And because of the fact that there is a judgment, we are accountable for how we live and what we do with what God has given us. All right? so that's all the time that we have for this evening. Let's close with a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you, Lord, for this lesson. And we pray that you would help us to recognize our responsibilities toward you with all that you have entrusted to us. Help us, Lord, to live to glorify you and not to be selfish. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you for coming, everyone. Good night.